Well, good morning, everyone. It's Sunday, and here we are again. My name is Jeff Lindsay, senior pastor, and I extend a welcome to you all on behalf of this church and the staff. And I extend a welcome to those who are watching us online or by Zoom. And you know who you are, and we know who you are. But if we don't know who you are, we would want to know who you are. So let us know. I'm looking at you. We're grateful that each week the rhythm of the church is to gather in Jesus' name and to stand alongside like-minded people, to be buoyed up with the good news of the gospel and the hope that we have in God's faithfulness, and then to muster our faith and to live the life that God calls us to live, to be used by God, to transform a world that desperately needs it. Amen? Amen. I'm going to give you this invitation because I know later in the service I'm going to be preaching from Amos. And Amos is a tough message. It's a hard message for us to hear. But I want you to know that from the words of Jesus, the context is that God is going to be with us in that hard message, helping us to live out and be faithful to the call. From Matthew 11, this is what Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. God invites us to look to God, to listen to God, to follow God, and in that space we will be as God calls us to be and experience the fullness of the kingdom that he desires for us. Welcome to worship. Welcome to the spirit. The presence of God's spirit and welcome to the fellowship of like-minded people. Let's continue to worship as we sing together. Please be seated. Many years ago, the theologian Karl Barth said that when ministers speak, 
they should do so with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Now, if we do this this week, our hearts would break, and we'd hardly know what to say. And so we pray. Please pray with me. Our powerful God, you who have the eternal perspective, you know the beginning of things. You know the end of things. But you also understand the messy, sometimes chaotic middle of life's situations. At some points, Lord, we actually want to advise you about what would be best, more to our liking, something more comfortable for us. Forgive us, Lord, that we would presume to guide your decisions. Bring us into alignment with your desires, your priorities, your choices. We confess that if we were to have our way, life may likely backfire and become even more complicated, if that's possible. And Lord, you don't want our human ways of placating you and subtly or not so subtly trying to manipulate you. You see right through that. Our superficial, formal worship at times, exercises, our sometimes pretentious celebrations that may not even be from the heart. Or at times even our shallow, half-hearted expressions of worship where we only give half our attention to you. God, forgive us and revitalize our heart for worship. Help us to simply pay attention to you, not out of fear, but out of gratitude, trust, and love for you. Enable us to listen to your word and actually hear you speak to us, guiding our minds, lifting our emotions, healing our bodies, and recalibrating our will that we may put our devotion into action. May our expressions in worship never be mere meaningless noise, but a heartfelt prelude to meaningful growth. May we turn our words into work on behalf of those in our world who need an advocate, who long for the resources to live free and full lives, who already strive for growing fairness and transformation in our world. This we pray in your name. We pray for those in our community, Lord, who need your touch today. For healing and hope, we pray for Lori Rebers and Jean Maston, for Penny Anderson, Joyce Lovestrand, Ann Bullington, Don Cook, Sean Radke. And for comfort and courage, for the family of Betty Dresser, for Duke and Jeannie London in their family's recent loss, and for the family of Dax Davidson, parents Peter and Kelsey, and grandparents Rob and Jane Davidson. Lord, bring your healing, bring your comfort, bring your spirit. We celebrate the flowers given today by Jeff and Suzanne and gratefulness for our church community and Lord, we're grateful for that affirmation as well. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
if I seem to be squinting at the notes that I have is because earlier this morning someone spilled coffee on my notes. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you who it was. I don't want to call anyone out. But. Anyway, welcome you again. And, and those of you who are online in, in particular right now, I've talked to a couple people in the last week or two, and uh, one was a couple who said, you know, we, uh, oh, you look familiar. And I said, well, yeah, I guess I just have a familiar face. And the, the wife said, no, take your hat off for a moment. As soon as I took my hat off, she recognized me. I don't know why. <laughs> but she said, no, we, we watch you on, on television. You're there from time to time. And uh, yeah, we, we love being, you know, virtually connected with Colonial. So welcome, uh, Fred and Janet and, uh, and all others. I talked to another friend of mine whose wife was very, very ill. And I just asked him, I said, has some folks from your church been by to, to see you? She'd been ill for some time. He said, well, I don't know if they even know who we are. Because, you know, to your, your point, uh, because we attend virtually all the time. And I said, they'd want to know who you are. They, they'd want to connect with you. They'd want to reach out to you. Give them the opportunity to do that, please. So let us know who you are. Stay connected. The old way is, you know what? It's the church's responsibility to reach out to us. They should read our minds and know what we need. And then for a while is, no, it's our responsibility to reach out to the church. How could they possibly read our minds? How? Well, now it's kind of a, a joint effort. We, we collaborate with one another. Whether you're here or online, we can't read each other's minds. So let us know who you are, what you need, what you would, what you would enjoy, and how you'd like to be involved. Today, speaking of being involved, 11 o'clock right after this service, uh, we have our quarterly town hall meeting. Today's topic is uh, ministry updates from the various aspects of our ministry. So come enjoy hearing about that and then off offering your voice to that discussion. Wednesday, 6 to 7 o'clock, right after supper, a faith and family event. Uh, Jeff Lindsay will be speaking about the sandwich generation. Now, we first heard about the sandwich generation about a generation ago. And back when we were the kids, and our parents had to pay attention to us, but then also pay attention to their parents. And then, you know, 15 years later, oh, now we're paying attention to our kids and our parents, and now I'm on the other end where I, okay, well, those young, younger adults, uh, what, what, what do you do? You know, you're pulled in both directions, and you're the, the center of the sandwich. So Jeff will be talking about that, giving some ideas about how to connect with our family in very positive ways. Then Monday night uh, starts tomorrow, 6.30 in the hearth room. Uh, it's a women's uh, evening event, Bible study. And you'll be reading a book from, by Kate Bowler saying, everything happens for a reason and other lies I've believed. Now, if you're on the receiving end of, hey, everything happens for a reason, I'm not going to tell you what, I, what my, I'm thinking as I hear that. So uh, she has very intriguing thoughts, and it'll be a great conversation. So tomorrow night in the hearth room. 20 bucks for the book, but if you need a scholarship, that's great. They're provided. So today, God's garden. Paul's not here. You're going to have to help me, okay? <laughs> Y'all know the words, so kids, come on up and head. Is that Colleen over there? Head over toward Colleen, and we're going to sing you on your way. You ready? Come, oh come, come to the garden. Yeah. to say hello to us? <laughs> Hi, church. <laughs> Have fun, kids. All right. Yeah, th thank you. That's the first time I've done that and probably the last. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Where are we? Peace of the church. Yes, let's, uh, 
Let's all stand and give God's peace and encouragement to one another today. Good morning, friends and community. It's my pleasure today to bring you the word of the Lord from Amos 5, 18 to 24. And I'd like to remind you and put in a word that after reading this out of my Bible this week, this is a, even though these words were written to humans in a different place, speaking a different language at a different time in the mid 8th century BCE, they are for us, God's people today, because sometimes we think we know what God wants, and then God tells us differently. So I also invite, as we read in community, I'm reading the words, but I'm going to give an invitation at the end, and I've heard people say it as I've been a member in this church, that we say the word of the Lord, and then what do we say at the end? Thanks be to God. So I will extend that, that if you are in agreement with these words, not just listening, but you want to take them to heart, then we will say that together. All right. Amos 5. Alas for you, excuse me, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen 
to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, even for the words of Amos. Lord God, we pray that you would help us to hear your words and what that means, but have it in the larger context that it's an invitation for us to come and to, to take on the task that you call us to, knowing that you will be with us to uphold us, to direct us, to lead us, so I grant us grace and forgiveness when we fall short, to put us back on our feet to collectively and individually to keep doing the work until your kingdom comes. This we pray in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Let justice roll down. Came from the lips of Martin Luther King Jr. one warm summer day in 1963 as his plaintive words became the rallying cry for a movement of justice for all people across this country. Today we both rejoice that to some degree Dr. King's dream has made progress. We also lament that there remains part of that dream that are still only that, a dream. Because justice means every person has equal access to what they are due impartially and fairly. Current events across the country with Memphis at the forefront reminds us of God's call to be people who muster their voice, resources, influence to help and turn the tide of injustice of all kinds. Often in the Bible, a quartet of individuals are mentioned in connecting with doing justice, widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor. These four groups of individuals often bore the brunt of injustice in their land. Do we know, church, that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wants all of creation to experience the fullness of God's kingdom? This is not some sweet by and by when we die but the abundance and the abundant experience of God's love, grace, provision, justice, and inclusion in the here and now. God's spirit is moving to accomplish God's desire. Will we, will we expand our efforts? Early in the book of Amos, our prophet of the morning lists these actions that stand in opposition to God's desires. They include selling people into slavery to pay small debts, ignoring the poor, and having corrupt business practices. The powerful prey upon the weak and alter the rules of society so that the rich grow more prosperous at the expense of the poor. Yet amid the injustice and iniquity and inequality the people would dutifully offer their sacrifices. They would go about their religious practices as if there was no overlap. They did not challenge the system or care about the poor. Church, do we know that God cares about those who have no power? Through the prophets, God called out their plight to God's people and challenge God's people to, admit, to attend to the needs of the poor and powerless as a part of their true worship. The good news 
in today's lesson is that God is involved in creation and cares about everyone. As God's people, are we to care as well? In what seems to be an upside down world of God's kingdom, the poor and needy are the people who catch God's attention. Remember the parable of the rich man and the poor man Lazarus? The poor man went to heaven, not the rich man. And Jesus didn't spend much time ministering to the political and religious leaders. Instead, Jesus ministered to the needs of the demon possessed, the blind, the lame the lepers, those who were disenfranchised and neglected by society. So this morning, I, I wonder if this church might be ready to expand its footprint of loving care to the powerless. A question to wrestle with each day is if God cares, shouldn't all who worship God care too? Are we, not to prior, are we not to prioritize our life around those things important to God that Jesus came to bear witness to? There are occasions when we as parents need to raise our voices to our children. This is not to be verbally abusive, but to accentuate the seriousness of the messages we at times are communicating to them. In Amos, God offered direction with a raised voice. You can read it in Amos 1, 2. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither and the top of camels dry up. I'm sure as a church we recognize that injustice and inequality and inequity surrounds us. The list could be endless and we could argue about what should or should not specifically be on that list. But I hope we can agree that as a church we must continue to grow in the impact we can have together fighting injustice and inequity and inequality as we live out our core values right here on the platform. In our neighborhoods, in our cities, and potentially around the world. Friends, we each need to consider, I believe, what it means to be a part of a true welcoming church, the top of our core values. We need to ask ourselves, who, who do I greet that maybe is new or I don't know? I might have to cross the aisle to get to them or across the meeting house to get to them, but shouldn't we wonder whose story did I listen to this morning? What new friend did I create this morning as we gather as the people of God, worshiping together, fellowshipping together? Even more so, who am I? Who am I inviting to join this fellowship to hear about God's love for them? And we each need to ponder what risks we have taken in our faith journey, as we stretch from our comfort zone to embrace a new idea maybe, a new way of doing something, a new relationship or an expression of my gifts, or not, because it's just too messy. Do we ask ourselves, are we willing are we really willing to wrestle with long-standing beliefs and practices? Are we ready to be transformed by God's leading and show up a bit differently in the world today and a bit differently day by day? Are we where we want to be or where God is calling us to be? And can we ask ourselves as a faith community whether we are immersed in sacred spaces and practices, recognizing that they may look and feel different than before? Have we asked ourselves lately, what are we praying for? And through what lens am I reading and interpreting scripture? And how much space do I make available for God's spirit 
to have access to my soul. Lastly, what might we learn if we ask ourselves if we are genuinely doing good or just doing? Do you know that there is a fundamental, fundamental difference between being nice and being kind? Nice is easy because we do it when we want to, when it feels comfortable, or when we aren't really too invested in the outcome. Kindness, however, is when we don't want to do good, but we do it anyway. Doing good for Christ's sake. As Lisa said, Amos is one of those most relevant, practical, and contemporary books of the Minor Prophets. The times in which Amos lived are remarkably similar to the social and cultural conditions of our own day. Amos was a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah and Hosea. He came from a little town 10 miles south of Jerusalem. It was on the edge of a desert, a desolate and barren place, and God called him. <clears throat> called him even though Amos was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. Amos was just an ordinary farmer from a small town trying to make a living. And it was while he was tending his sheep and caring for his orchards that he became aware of the conditions of the day. Amos lived on a much-traveled route and caravans would pass through his town. And this is where he learned of the needs of the day and the needs of the time. And God called him to speak out to the people of God. Amos was from Judah, which was in the south. But God called him to go to Israel, which was in the north. This didn't go over very well. While there was peace between the northern and southern kingdoms, there was still a lot of strife between the people. The situation could be compared to our country 100 years ago. It'd be like a rebel going north and telling the Yankees they need to get their lives right. Besides that, in Israel, things were going pretty well. How dare you? There was a period of peace and prosperity between the conquering armies of Assyria and Egypt, and so they wondered if they finally had arrived. Wealth abounded for some. On the other hand, there was luxury and self-indulgence on the one hand and abject poverty on the other. The government was corrupt. There was evidence of extortion. There were riots and violence and class hatred. Dishonesty was the rule rather than the exception. There was also gross indifference to suffering. The religious conditions followed the same pattern, sadly. Outwardly, it seemed that religion was thriving. Attendance was good. The treasuries were full. And religious pilgrimages were common to the holy cities of Gilgal and Bethel. But inside, they were sick. Their priests were little more than professional con artists. They would preach what would tickle the ears of the people. Immorality was practiced in the name of God. There was so much hypocrisy, superstition, and insincerity. Righteousness was hated and opposed. It wasn't just discouraged. It was sometimes opposed violently. Amos saw the judgment of God coming upon the nation. But the most significant threat then and now was in the religious community. Amos was God's gift to Israel. Amos was God's attempt to convey the message to God's people to turn back, to come around again. But they had their minds and their consciences turned off. They wouldn't listen. They told Amos to go home. In chapters one and two, Amos speaks of the judgment on the surrounding nations. Of course, Israel liked that part. Amos repeated the phrase, for three sins, even four. He uses this formula to focus attention on that final item. He doesn't even list the first three, but moves directly to the fourth, because this, this would be the last straw that brings the judgment of God. 
that brings the judgment of God down to the actual audience to whom his message is directed. Israel, God's people. Amos describes in great detail the conditions I mentioned briefly, corruption and greed, immoral activity, and the overwhelming desire for pleasure at any cost. In chapter five, our chapter this morning, he says three times, seek the Lord that you may live. But they wouldn't listen. Bringing us to today's text. This morning's text is probably one of the most famous sections of Amos. And it introduces for the first time in scripture the concept of the day of the Lord. This is a term that appears only in prophetic texts. What do we think? Church, what do you think when you hear the phrase day of the Lord? Do you think of the second coming of Jesus? I think that's what most people think of. That glorious time when we'll leave this old world and go to heaven. Well, in Israel's mind, the day of the Lord was when God's judgment would fall on all the other nations on their behalf. On that day, Israel would be liberated from those heathen nations and become the dominant political force that they longed to be. Many of their feasts and festivals celebrate the coming day of the Lord, but Amos gives a clear picture of what the day of the Lord would actually be for them, for Israel. As Lisa read, first it would be a time of darkness, not light. People thought it would be a bright, happy time of celebration, that they finally would be the nation they longed to be, that they felt God had promised them to be. Instead, it would be a time of unprecedented despair. There'd be no place for them to escape the judgment of God. The judgment coming because they wouldn't follow. They wouldn't live the life that God called them to live. Remember from our text, Amos says it would be like someone running from a lion only to meet a bear. From something ferocious to something even worse. And in desperation, this person finally manages to get home where they think they're gonna be safe. A house, a place of safety and shelter. They arrive breathlessly, leaning their hand against the wall, to catch a breath, and as they do, a snake, hidden in some crevice, emerges to bite them. Tough story, tough realization of where Israel has found themselves. The death they thought they would escape awaited them in their own house. No safety, no escape anywhere. As it says in verse 20, not only darkness, but pitch dark without a ray of light, pitch dark. A far cry from the joyful expectations the people of Israel had. In verse 21 through 23, Amos details some of the things that helped bring on that judgment. God says, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I can't stand your assemblies. Each of the essential elements of your worship were examined. In each case, they were rejected by God. Why? It's because of how they showed up. What God required was not the ritual of offerings, but rather right living. Righteousness in the courts and in the marketplace and in every aspect of conduct in the community and personal life. Because this, this is the essential element of the worship that God desires. But these saints are all still performing their duty on occasion and thought it would be enough to cause God to overlook the sin in their lives. But their commitment to God is revealed in their lifestyles. They pretend to rejoice, they pretend to praise the Lord and have their solemn worship assemblies. All the right moves all the proper motions, but what does the scripture say? God hated it. It became an abomination to God. God said to take it away. Amos clarifies their situation by saying, even though you bring me choice offerings, it's a waste of time. It's just a way of trying to buy me off. 
The religion of Israel was full of strict attention to detail. Everything was celebrated regularly and correctly, but it was all an empty show rather than the true devotion to God. People, do we know that God doesn't simply desire observance of rituals? God wants right conduct. God wants us to live right, to live faithfully. Those are the actions of true worship of how our relationship with God in Jesus transforms our lives, how we allow that transformation to come. Micah, whom we talked about a couple weeks ago, was a contemporary of Amos. Micah 6, 6 through 8 asks, Shall I come with burnt offerings, thousands of rams, even my firstborn? No. No. What does the Lord require? You know these words, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly with open hands and open hearts, with looking to God for direction. Verse 23 in Amos says, away with the noise of your songs. The music was sweet, but it wasn't being offered humbly to God. It was just a step in an empty process. I know as you're listening to me today, as we together are listening to these words of Amos, it's harsh realities. Amos was sent to get Israel's attention with this harsh exposure of their choices. Will our hearts be exposed? It's helpful to remember here that when God deals harshly with God's people, it's always redemptive in nature. It's never meant just to beat them down, but to intend to help them get their focus back where it needs to be, where God longs for it to be. Eyes focused on God. Following the examples of Jesus. This brings us to verse 24, which begins with a conjunction. But let justice roll. What's God saying? God wants us to turn back. Specifically, God is saying, as Micah said, to act justly, to be honest and to live faithfully. That means in our everyday life, in our dealings with others, whether business or social. Don't take unfair advantage. Strive, strive to treat everyone as God would treat them. It also means being honest before God and recognizing our true nature and to repent and then pursue the never-ending stream of righteousness found in Jesus. The answer is to pursue that never-ending stream of righteousness that can be found in Jesus. God has not left us alone. He hasn't left us desperate. He's given us an opportunity. He's given us a choice. He's redirecting us. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, on the last day of the festival, that great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out. Jesus cries out these words. Let everyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. We're thirsty, people, aren't we? We need to drink from that never any stream of righteousness that God offers us in Jesus. So church, what if we were to examine ourselves? Examine our motives honestly and make the adjustments that God's spirit leads us to. Can we even imagine what that would mean for us? What that might mean for the world around us? Amos gives us a straightforward call at the end of today's lesson. Amos says, but let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Friends, 
We are to be desert streams. We're not a spring that just fills a designated space. We collectively are to be a stream that flows and provides life-giving water to a parched desert land. So, as I was writing this this week, I was asking myself hard questions. Can I stand here and say this? Can I stand here saying that I'm committed and ready? All I can say is I pray that I am. I, I desire to be. I want to do it with you. I want us to do it together. I want us to join the larger church here and around the world who are seeking to be as God calls us to be to strive to have our worship pleasing to the Lord as we share God's love and grace with those around us. This will mean, with God's help, we stand against injustice and fight for equality and inclusion for all. We do this to experience the dream of everyone experiencing equality, the fullness of God's kingdom, here. Amen? Let us pray. God, you know I didn't want to preach this sermon. It's hard words. Recognizing the church in the world today and your call upon us, it's hard. It seems impossible, but with you all things are possible. That's your promise. You tell us to to take your work upon us because with your help, it won't be as hard as we think? Question mark. But God, maybe as we seek you, keeping our eyes on you, the, the waves of the water around us won't feel so overwhelming. Keeping our eyes on you, Jesus, we might be able to face the storms of this life. And knowing that we do it together, your people standing together, we can do it. We can make a dent. We can strive for change. So Lord, come. Speak into each of our hearts and minds. Hear our prayers of our desires of our heart. Unite us together around your purposes that we might be found faithful. Found faithful in life-giving, life-transforming ways for this world. For we pray this in your name. Amen.
love the percussion. Nice. Kaylin Larson is back with us, our former chorale director, and we are so glad to have you with us. You bless us. And I think since the last time you were here, you got engaged. So congratulations. How about that? Woo! And of course, John Carson is back with us, the son of our wonderful organist. We're so glad that you would come and be a part of our worship. You bless us. You know, uh, it's always fun as the, one of the pastors of this church to hear about the generosity of this congregation. One, some of you might know that we have a, a program here in the church called the Acts of Love. Acts of Love is an email that goes out sharing needs of some of our congregation. It might be a meal, it might be a ride, it might be something even more extensive than that. We sent the, a text out this past week and we said there's a, some family members that have some medical issues that need some attention that the, takes someone who is willing to come and come to their house and help them. And one of our members said, you know what, I can do that. And that means that this person is gonna get the care that they need, that they can have the life that they need stay, staying in their own home. When I hear those stories, when I hear about you hearing the needs of others and responding, it just, it does something to my heart. It does something to your heart too, and I'm just grateful that we are listening as, the God, as God leads us. <clears throat> at the end of your row, you'll notice uh, somewhere, probably over in the ends of these rows, there's some, there some bags that are there. We want you to grab those bags, and here's one of the three things I would like to encourage you to do. One, if you brought an offering today, you can stick it in that bag. If you have a prayer need today that you would like the staff and others to be praying for, there's some cards in the pew. You can write that down and stick it in that bag. If you're new with us and you would like for us to know that you're new, you can write your information down and we will respond to you, let you know that we are grateful that you were here and find ways that we can connect you better. If you have been thinking this month about our stewardship campaign and you brought your card, you can stick that in your bag as well. If you're still pondering, if you're still looking to God to lead you in terms of where you might invest in this ministry, you can hold it even longer and put it in the box that's out uh, at the receptionist's desk. Or, here's what I might encourage you to think about. If you're still praying and asking God's Spirit to reveal to you what that might mean, come to our town hall meeting. Come and hear what God is doing in our midst. The programs that we're involved with, the places that we're thinking about, how we are trying to expand our footprint of being a greater blessing uh, in this community and beyond that. And then, and then respond by thinking about what your gift of stewardship would be in the upcoming year. We are grateful for your generosity. We're grateful for your support of the work that we're doing. It takes all of us, and it takes all of us to continue to do this good work. So listen to God, follow that leading, and together we will be the church that we need to be. Let me pray. God, grateful we are that uh, your spirit does come to us, whispers into our hearts and minds. Give us courage then to follow. We pray this in your name, amen. One last quick antidote. So one of our longtime members came up to me and said, I've been listening to you. I'm grateful for this stewardship campaign. I'm grateful for the invitation that you give us to, to prayerfully consider what God might want. But pastor, I have a, a big question for you. What if the Spirit tells me something I don't want to do? <laughs> Being a good pastor, then I may have said, that's between you and God. <laughs> let's stand and let's continue to worship together.
caught up in the words of the song, so I was a little delayed. What if we did abandon all those things from earth that keeps us from living that abundant life? Wow, what a goal that would be for us as a community of faith. Before we go, just a couple other quick things I want you to think about. Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights is that midweek time for the church to gather. We have a meal together. Kids go off to programs. The choir prepares for the next week's worship. And each week we have some kind of class that invites adults to think about things that would help them grow in their faith. This week, as Mark said, I'm going to be talking about the Sandwich Generation as a part of our Faith and Family series. But each other week, we have been following a curriculum called Animate. And people have gotten confused thinking it's a bunch of cartoons. And so I'm, I'm not interested in that. It's not what it is. It's actually a curriculum that is helping us to think about some important aspects of our faithful walk that inspires us and encourages us. We get to do it together around tables. And so I invite you, if you're looking for a midweek encouragement to your faith, come by on a Wednesday night. Be with other people. Share that fellowship. And let's study some good things together. Lastly, I want to get, extend, remind you again that we are having a town hall meeting. It will be a chance for you to know some of the things that are happening outside the places where you find most of your, your uh, time in the life of the church. I think it will be inspiring and encouraging to you to encourage you to go that direction. We don't have donut holes and coffee out in the North Common. They're down by the Great Hall, and today it's bagels. <laughs> I know. It's, we're trying to bribe you. So... <laughs> We encourage you to be a part of that, to, to join around some tables to hear what's happening and to discuss what that might mean for us as a church. Receive this benediction as we go. I remind you that Amos's words were harsh and a challenge to us. But remember that the purpose was to re-empower, to re-encourage, for help us to reimagine what it means to be the people of God and to live that life of faith. So may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you his peace now and forever. Amen and amen.